Good evening. Thank you for joining the fourth session in our Austin-focused National Drive Electric Week series. I am Aaron Choate, the coordinator of Austin EB, the Austin chapter of the Electric Auto Association. Tonight, we're going to be talking with Tom Smitty Smith with Texedra. He has a presentation to get us started, then we'll move into a Q&A. Feel free to add your questions to the chat as we go along, if you'd like, and I'll um, share them, or um, you may unmute yourself and ask your questions yourself. Okay, Smitty, want to get started? Thanks, everybody, and thanks for joining. I've met many of you over time, and uh, it's good to uh, see your faces. Um, I am now working with the Texas uh, Electric Transportation Resources Alliance. And it's a new group, a little bit more than two years old now, that is working to develop policy, largely uh, at the state capital level here, to make sure that Texas can play in the coming electric vehicle revolution. Um, and so we are an alliance of utilities and charging companies and manufacturers of electric automobiles and trucks and environmentalists and we have a number of other people that have joined in as well that aren't so neatly categorized but all have a stake in the electric vehicle movement and we have monthly meetings to talk about electric vehicle policy we have 106 people on the mailing list for that group um, and about half of them show up at our monthly meetings and it's a revolving cast of characters. Um, and so one of the things that we began with, and, and this was the model essentially, of getting the smartest people we could find in Texas together in a room to develop policy, that many of us used to develop the policy that has led to the renewable energy boom uh, that's transforming Texas. So there are big questions we need to answer. Uh, how are we going to plug them in and how are we going to keep from overloading the grid? How do we deal with equity questions? And we think of equity as most often being low income, but it's actually geographic inequities. And um, we're seeing that really play out now with the uh, lack of broadband infrastructure in rural Texas and in poor areas, and roughly a third of people in Texas can't work from home or can't go to school because they don't have adequate broadband. Uh, and we need to do something about that. What kind of consumer protections do we need to put into place? And how do we assure that the batteries get recycled? And there are actually many more questions that have popped up over time, but those are the really big ones. Now, Around the world, electric vehicles are quickly coming onto the market. And when you look at the reasons that's happening, it's the environmental impacts. Our urban areas around the world, particularly in Asia and in Europe, are heavily clogged primarily with diesel pollution, but also a lot of emissions coming from two cycle engines in Asia. Because, and another big reason is because countries have made climate commitments to reduce their emissions. And now in the United States and in most other parts of the world, the largest single sources of climate emissions are coming from our transportation sector. And right in Texas, it's about a third of the climate emissions come from our tailpipes and about a third come from the industrial sector. But when you look at the industrial sector, about half of that is related to oil and gas extraction, transportation, and refining. And so the part of the pie that's uh, associated with um, the oil cycle is far greater than just the tailpipe emissions. As somebody who owns an EV, as many of you do, we all have benefited from lower maintenance costs. Consumer Reports came out with a report for, uh, I guess, last Thursday that said, on average, maintenance costs are about one half on an electric vehicle than they are in a traditional vehicle. And that number is probably inflated because the earliest batteries are not as good as the newer batteries. Uh, and because many of those in their survey were also plug-in hybrids that also have traditional internal combustion engines. But the fuel costs are typically one third 
of what the costs are in Texas than buying uh, uh, fossil fuels. And electric prices don't go up and down like other uh, like uh, fossil fuel prices do. And for emerging countries, as one guy in India said, hey, this is our Henry Ford moment. We get we are first in the market. We're going to end up selling electric vehicles to y'all. He didn't say y'all. Um, <laughs> anyway, we also can power them with renewable energy and with battery storage. And interestingly, as the battery prices decline for electric vehicles, they're also declining for energy storage, and that's going to have an enormous impact. This busy little chart basically shows what kind of investment we're seeing worldwide about 374 billion in terms of new electric technologies, about 5.3 billion, 5.4 billion in the United States. And um, we're all benefiting today from the tremendous impact that that's going to have, Tesla's going to have on our economy. It's estimated there will be over 200 new electric vehicle models on the road by 2020, including 10 pickups. And this little chart shows what those vehicles are, but if you look to the right and look carefully, and it's a tiny slide, what you see is that as you start to get past around 2022, suddenly it's all, almost all SUV models that are on the road in the electric vehicle fleet. You know, certainly you're going to have a lot, some sedans, like some of the Teslas, but you know, really that's it's the SUVs and vans that are going to come to dominate the electric vehicle movement. And that gets and becomes important when we talk about a point later. Now, battery prices have dropped roughly 80% uh, since the first EVs came out. And I'm an early adopter. I have a, 20, 10, a 2011 uh, volt that I bought in 2010. And it was roughly $1,000 a kilowatt hour when one of my former staff people, before I retired, bought her bolt it was down uh, around $180 a kilowatt hour. It's now getting really close to $100 a kilowatt hour for a storage battery in an electric vehicle. And when you get to that point, what you see is that it quickly becomes cheaper to buy an electric car than it does an internal combustion engine car. And we expect to hit that break even point, 2022, 23, somewhere in there. And at the same time, the density or the amount of range that you can cover for a kilowatt hour of charge has been going up uh, six to seven percent per year. Now, many of us are old enough to remember significant transitions that have occurred in our lifetime in terms of products. My grandparents grew up driving horses and buggies. My grandfather bought his first electric vehicle in 20. I'm sorry, 1914, that car lasted the family 20 years. But within 15 years, automobiles became the dominant source of transition, and it was harder and harder to find draft horses and somebody to fix your harnesses. I grew up listening to the radio. It wasn't until I was seven that we got our first TV. Most of us remember film cameras. They switched very quickly to digital cameras, landlines to cell phones. Uh, mainframes to desktops, um, and now we're all running around with cell phones that got more computing power than a mainframe used to have. And renewables are the most recent substantial transformation that have occurred in just the last 20 years. Now, what are the projections for how fast this is going to happen? Now, this is a 2030 chart that we put together in January. It's wrong um, and is now outdated and we're updating our slides uh, this week. But basically, what the what the, uh, we're seeing Bloomberg, which is kind of the main line analysis, says that we'll have 1.8 million vehicles in Texas, or about 7% of the fleet by 2030. We took a look at what happened when the SUVs came to market in Texas and how quickly that transformed. And if you did that analysis and applied the same kind of swift change to the vehicle technology as happened with SUVs in under 10 years, would have about double that, uh, or about 15% of the market. Now, 
when you get to the 2035 area, we're looking maybe 40% of the sales. Um, and we're looking at um, about a quarter of the fleet. Now, let me make this a more sober prediction. In order to win the climate battle, we got to have 40% of all the fleet being electric by 2030. So we got a lot of work to do. We got a lot of work to do fast. But having a, been a, um, a part of the uh, movement toward renewable energy, I think we can do it. Now, why is why are truckers going to be the big winners, and why are they so excited about it? If you go 200 miles on diesel, it's about 200 bucks. If you do that same 200 miles, um, it's about 100 bucks. Rather. If you do that same 200 miles, it's 23 dollars to go the same distance on electricity. That's what's really gonna transform transportation. It's not just trucks, it's buses, it's delivery vehicles. And for those of us who get packages almost every day uh, by a, um, a UPS truck or a FedEx that pulls up, sits outside our house and idles, the opportunity to have a non-polluting vehicle running around our neighborhood is a tremendous way to reduce pollution. And the interesting number is that most UPS trucks go less than 65 miles a day. And so an electric technology that might be able to go 200 miles is overkill, but they can certainly do a whole round of deliveries in one charge. Now, most of us charge at home, 80% of us charge at home almost all the time. Um, but about half of the people in Austin live in rental or multifamily units. And we're gonna to need to build a charging system to serve them. Uh, there's workplace charging. Uh, some people uh, are able to go to work and charge and that's becoming more and more commonplace, especially in new built buildings. But we're also gonna to have to build a network of fast chargers to be able to plug in and be fully charged in 20 minutes or 40 minutes, whatever it's gonna to take to do that. Now, the voltage is, the good news is that for most of the charging systems, we're not gonna have to really upgrade the grid until we get into multi-port charging stations on our interstates or in our rural areas where we start to plug in heavy duty trucks. Now, where does this load come from? Uh, and when, is it, when do people charge? Again, mostly at night. And the good news is much of the energy that we're gonna need is coming from renewable energy, the wind out west at night. And during the day, what's interesting is that when you plug in during work, if you use the charging timers that come with every electric vehicle, you can take advantage of daytime solar. It really starts to pick up at about 10, really booms from about 10 until about three or four in the afternoon, and then starts to drop off. But that actually is when the wind comes in from West Tech, from the, the coastal areas of Texas. And so we have sort of a symphony of renewable energy. It ain't quite 24 seven and we'll get there with battery storage to where we can completely cover the energy demand curve with renewable energy. But the good news is EV charging and renewable production match each other pretty much perfectly. UT took a look at this and said, you know, we don't have to worry about building more power plants. If we just manage our charging, we can su supply the load, all the load needed by the projected number of electric vehicles with the energy resources we have today. Now, this is a picture of the dashboard of my Volt. It looks like old technology. It is increasingly old technology, but every vehicle, electric vehicle has something like this, and you can preset to tell the car when it is you want to leave on my car or when you want to begin charging. And so you set it to where it starts to charge after the peak power is demanded uh, in the middle of the day and be fully charged in the morning. Now, fast chargers are gonna be an issue unless we get ahead of it and begin to plan. Now, if you start to think about a charging station for a delivery van like this Amazon Rivian vehicle, and you have to recharge it for whatever reason during the day, um, you're in a situation where you might need 300 kilowatt hour, and, and that's not a lot of energy. But boy, you start to do a semi-trailer truck and you're talking about 1.5 megawatts, that's about what a Walmart store 
uh, charge needs. And so you start to, for energy, so you start to multiply that and you get as much energy as a small town might need. And so we really got to begin to think about placing these chargers in locations where there's adequate transmission and distribution capacity. And we have done that. Uh, we have worked with a group of the big electric utilities and we're blessed to have as part of our membership the former vice president for uh, system planning at ERCOT that manages the grid and they came up with this little busy map to show where you could put charging stations every 50 miles where the transmission and distribution system are adequate to be able to handle that load. So let me take you on a road trip. Most of you have been out to Big Bend or El Paso and have driven down I-10 to get there. And to get there, you go out 290 through Fredericksburg and you cut down some little country road to get on to I-10 right around Sonora. And you look at Sonora, it's got pencil thin power lines. You don't want to put charging systems in there, even though it's sort of a junction of two major highways. But you come in to Junction, Texas, about 30 miles down the road, and you can see all these big power lines coming out of North and West Texas, where the wind is being carried from all of those wind turbines out in West Texas. That's a great place to put power lines at Junction. Plus, it's already got a bunch of truck stops. You go on to other places like Fort Stockton, where you're starting to pick up a lot of the solar energy. And the good news is about every 50 miles, there's a confluence of our major highways and transmission and distribution systems are, actually, are fat enough to be able to handle a bank of high-speed charging systems for um, uh, heavy-duty trucking. And for all the light-duty vehicles are gonna be charging as well. We just have to come up with a plan and get this adopted. We're gonna ask you to work your legislators and ask them to develop a high-speed border-to-border charging plan We'll get back to that toward the end of the presentation. Now, one of the things we're gonna to have to do as well is make sure that we do have um, charging systems all over the state and in our, our rural areas as well as in our low income areas. Otherwise, they're not gonna benefit from the advantages of electric transportation. And again, it's about half as much to maintain one of these things. It's about a third as much to fuel one. If you're a low income family, typically you spend north of 30% of your monthly income on transportation. Partially because the cars you buy are um, typically gonna carry a higher amount of credit. You may have worse credit and you may have to pay greater interest. And because older cars break down more frequently and require more maintenance costs than, a, than an electric vehicle would. So getting into an electric vehicle is a money saver and a budget saver for low income families. But they're not gonna look at an electric car unless they see a charging network built all over their city and available to them. You can put it in an apartment complex, you can do street side charging, you can put it at community centers as are pictured here. And the same thing is true with rural America. If you don't see a charging station, you're never gonna consider it. But once you get those charging stations dotting the, uh, the state of Texas, people are gonna think they can leave their small town with a full charge and get to the Walmart or the, the uh, courthouse or wherever they need to go in the next town. And that's what's really gonna transform rural America. Now, during the last session of the legislature, this discussion was pretty much premature. But what we did was we got uh, some amendments tacked on to a bill that basically said we want the PUC to look at the impact of electric vehicles on the grid. We want the um, TCEQ to look at the air emission benefits of electric vehicles. And in addition, to begin to take a look at using some of the funding from the VW settlement to help fund a charging network. And they are doing that. There's some grants open avail for that, and hopefully we'll, have, we'll get to that in a while. The, one of the big issues was how are we going to pay for roads and bridges if we start to have electric vehicles, especially if they become a big player. And so the Department of Motor Vehicles was charged with doing a study on how other states are assessing fees and what the sort of average is. 
and I would hope we have some discussion about that later too. When you start to look at what the average fee is around the United States, it's just under a hundred bucks for an electric vehicle to operate on the roads and bridges of the individual states. I could argue it should be less, but in the last legislative session, there were bills saying we want to charge a hybrid owner 200 bucks and we want to charge an electric vehicle owner 300 bucks, driven largely by oil and gas company funded lobby groups. And we're going to have a big fight over this during this next legislative session. And then the next question is who's going to inspect all these things? Uh, today, if you think about the oil and gas analogy, every time you see a gas pump, there's a sticker on it that says inspected now by the Department of Licensing and Regulation. It used to have a picture of Sid Miller, our ag commissioner, and that goes back to the days when um, the ag department was doing weights and measures at every grocery store and general store and went out and did a whole bunch of testing of their scales and the scales of the grain elevators and so forth during the last session the legislature in their wisdom and i think correctly so said let's move it over to a department of um, licensing and regulation and get it out from underneath uh, the uh, politically driven uh, department of agriculture now so we're beginning to look at an omnibus bill and these are preliminary thoughts we're working with a variety of different players on this to write this legislation we want to have something at the Public Utilities Commission on consumer protection and uh, trying to make sure that, public, that charging is considered a universal service. Um, we want to have the fees legislation passed. Uh, we want to look at TxDOT as well. They have some responsibility for making recommendations on what the fees ought to be. But if you're driving down the highway, we ought to make sure you have a blue sign that says electric vehicle charging at this upcoming intersection. Um, and rest stops, et cetera, are great places to put chargers. At the environmental agency, there's something in, already existing called the Texas Emission Reduction Program. We wanna make some modifications to their incentive, state incentive program. By the way, if you buy an EV in Texas, you can get a 25, buy or lease, you can get a $2,500 incentive from the state in addition to whatever federal incentives you might qualify for. But we want to make it payable and deductible from the bottom line when you're going in to buy that car. We think that will help. And we, there's a lot of debate um, in Congress about the opportunity to fund electric vehicle charging stations. And the other night, even Donald Trump said he was in favor of electric vehicles. And we need to establish recycling standards. Um, one of the big arguments made against electric vehicles is you're going to have all these batteries everywhere. Well, 80% of them go back to being re or reused for energy storage, but eventually we're going to have to recycle them. And there are good technologies available to do that. And then we need to have consumer protections in addition to inspection standards. So that's my um, presentation, and I'm really happy to answer any questions you all might have, and I'm hopeful we'll have a robust conversation. Um, so I, one of the first questions that came up, and you kind of started to get into it just, just now, is uh, around the recycling standards and, and policy related to that. Can you go a little bit more into that as to where uh, Texeter is on that and you know where can you know how, how do you see that kind of developing? We're in favor of recycling batteries that much I can tell you. Yeah. Uh, when you look at the technologies that are currently being uh, promoted whether it be by Tesla um, or many other com com uh, companies they basically fall into two categories certainly the larger of which is what do you do with the battery case um, but the more lucrative and that which will fund the rest of the recycling is what do you do with the uh, precious metals that are in the anodes and cathodes um, and what seems to be the emerging technology is you remove the anodes and cathodes you then re-refine those uh, centrifuge them out whatever 
and then you sell them back to chip manufacturers or to battery manufacturers for reuse. That's the um, plan that the offshoot from Tesla is beginning to develop. There's a company called American Magnesium based out of Canada is doing this. And that's essentially becoming the dominant way to pay for recycling these batteries. Now the cases, interestingly, are largely gonna be standardized and reusable. And I think you see several different models of that. GM has a platform, Volkswagen, Ford have platforms, Nissan, Renault have a platform, and Tesla certainly has their own. But, and there are a number of manufacturers that have much more sophisticated things than just their case that fits somewhere in the car. Um, but essentially, it's gonna be like changing the batteries in a flashlight. You pop the case open, you put in new anodes and cathodes, and there may be some other technological updates to the wiring harness or the computer chips. You do all that, slap it back together again. And voila, the battery goes rolling down the road. And then you just recycle that stuff, which um, you can and is most toxic. Perhaps I missed this when you started, Smitty. Um, uh, so the this, presumably this is an organization, you know, not a nonprofit. So is the basic goal of the organization to influence the legislators? And regulators. And, <laughs> and also to come to common agreement to solve problems. My experience has been after 40 years of lobbying around the Capitol, is you get the smart people in the room, all the stakeholders you can find, you can figure out 90% of the deal and how you make policy work in Texas. And then you go to the, le to the legislature, you ask for that 90% to be um, blessed, and there'll be about 5% of the decisions have to be made by the legislature because there's either pre-existing law that controls or might be difficult, or there are um, issues that have to do with um, establishing authorities over to and giving them to the various agencies. And about another 5% that has to be uh, worked through by some um, uh, regulatory agency and just adopted by uh, the Department of, of uh, Motor Vehicles as a fee or textile as a fee or has to be adopted um, standards for what the consumer protections and displays look like, and TDLR will have to do that. So, you know, we're a lobbying group. Yeah, that's the easiest way to describe what we do. But ultimately, our work is that of any coalition, which is trying to figure out how to solutions for what divides us. Mm, thank you. <clears throat> oh, and by the way, anybody can be a member who drives an electric vehicle or wants to be. We have about 800 odd members and we're growing five to ten a week something like that and um, we have periodic events and we have a really good newsletter that goes out we have a really really good facebook that's updated several times a day twitter all that other sort of stuff that we commonly do So how uh, how receptive are the uh, legislators to the legislators to this whole line of conversation? Actually, fairly receptive. Um, the there will certainly a big battle go brewing between oil and gas companies and those in the electric vehicle movement over um, the question of um, uh, whether or not we want to promote electric vehicles. But uh, the movement of Tesla to Texas has done more to bring this to the forefront as a new economic development opportunity than you can imagine. And when we did the first hearing uh, on electric vehicle integration into the grid um, last January, uh, just before the pandemic hit, um, it wasn't environmental advocates who were sitting down at the table 
talking about the wonders of EV. It was Peterbilt Trucks and Hunt Energy, an old oil company, now making a transition to uh, energy storage and talking about how we were going to be able to reduce everybody's electric bills in Texas by vehicle, by integrating battery storage uh, today and eventually vehicle to grid energy and seeing substantial reductions in the cost of energy for everybody in the state as a result of that. And, you know, the paradigm began to shift and people who had been carrying fee bills of $300 a year for electric vehicles suddenly started realizing this wasn't anti-business. This was the heart of making business easier to do in Texas. And if we didn't move quickly to capture the opportunity, we were going to be left behind in places like Alabama. We're going to be profiting by their decision to really support electric vehicle uh, innovation. Hmm. Yeah, I saw a, uh, <clears throat> I saw a study recently with uh, Tesla. the Tesla driver had it for two years and he spent like $5,000 total charging and tires and a hundred thousand miles. So one just today, a, uh, it was a, uh, <clears throat> there's, I guess there's a police department that's using uh, electric cars and they were saving like $7,000 a year or something like that. So mm -hmm. per car, I, you know, per car. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, imagine the police cars probably put a lot of miles on there and driving all over the place. Yeah. So yeah, I can see the businesses going on how you know that's that would be a savings. We like that, you know. One of the earliest likely adapters is PepsiCo. In, in other parts of the country and here in Texas, they're starting to look at um, kind of the medium duty delivery fleet, the, the little bobtail tractors that circulate around the city to deliver uh, product to all the grocery stores. And, and they're really looking initially at um, carrying their chip products, you know, all their Frito-Lay stuff, all that kind of stuff, because it's light. But for them, it's a no-brainer because the fuel costs are so low. HEB is really making a big investment. And um, Electrific electrified transportation in a couple of different ways. As they point out, we've had years of experience with vehicle electrification. We do all of our freight movement internally in our warehouses using electric forklifts. And we plug them in overnight, we charge them. Um, they're building four new million square foot warehouses and they're putting solar all over the roofs and they're using those leftover forklift batteries to store the energy and they're gonna to plan to integrate that into charging their electric vehicles. But their long range goal is to be able to do their 200 mile, 200 plus mile circuits from San Antonio to Houston, San Antonio to Dallas, drop off the tractor and then keep on moving the freight on to other places after it's been broken down into the freight that's useful for, to be redistributed to their local grocery stores uh, it served by those distribution centers. Mm. And, you know, HEB got some very smart people working for them. And yeah. as the guy said at the end of a, of a presentation he was making a year ago, October, full of other trucking companies, if you're not looking at electrification, you're going to be leaving a lot of money on the table. A lot of money. And Navistar, the, the old international harvester uh, trucking company chain, mm -hmm. has just opened up a manufacturing plant in San Antonio. They're going to be rolling their first electric school bus off the line sometime uh, or later this ne uh, next year. But, you know, they're not far from HEB headquarters. And I suspect there is a deal done between Navistar and HEB to help build that trucking um, uh, component for their fleet. Hmm. That's only my speculation, but the location, this, they always say location, location, location. <laughs> and if you've got, you got a client the size of HEB, why wouldn't you build a plant next to them? 
Yeah, that's maybe we had a question coming in from the chat related to the grid upgrades that are going to be required um, to support the solar and, and wind, but then also, you know, as you were talking about the further future, the several million EVs um, jumping on the grid. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what you guys have been, you know, talking about as far as what's going to be required there? Yeah, for the 120 charging and the 220 charging, not much. It's not even a blip on the screen if we manage the time at which we charge. And there are a bunch of different policies that are being utilized elsewhere that basically give drivers price signals for charging at night when wind provides energy that's in the pennies per kilowatt hour as opposed to at peak when it's in the dime plus per kilowatt hour. And so once you get the number, once you both are educated, and why not just charge on peak, but secondly, start to get a price signal and that technology that actually gives you time of use pricing signals will be on the market and is available in some areas and they're experimenting with that down in San Antonio now. It's a no brainer for most of us that own an EV. You're gonna charge when there's surplus power. So you're but, saying for the majority of, of like the next 10, 15 years, you know, we've got the capacity. It's just making right. sure people, okay, yeah. Yeah, but, and, you know, beyond that, and utility infrastructure takes a long time to build. We do need to factor that in. And that's why that charging map that I showed is so essential. If you put the, the big high-speed chargers that are gonna be utilized for charging a lot of vehicles at once, regardless of time, places where you've got transmission distribution capacity, you can do it without a lot of transmission distribution capacity build out. But we've got to be realistic with it. Where do people um, tend to congregate that have a lot of trucks next to the airports or next to the rail yards? And you take a map of um, Dallas-Fort Worth, for example, and you sort for warehouses, and it's just like big concentric rings around DFW or the airport uh, that I'm um, blanking on that uh, uh, up northwest of uh, Dallas or in the, in the, around Fort Worth up there, um, where it's all freight all the time, or Houston Hobby or, and Houston International. Um, you know, there's a lot there, but then you look at the ports and you look at the um, uh, rail yards, we're gonna need a lot of energy. And there's already a lot of energy there, but instead of just running big fans in those warehouses, we're gonna have to upgrade the system and then really begin to take a look at, instead of having half a dozen trucks that might require an upgrade to a transformer, we're going to have several thousand trucks. We got a plan for that, and that's going to take five years or more to really get that plan out there, approved by the Public Utilities Commission, and then underway. And so that we're underway with that planning process. And I think that the people at the PUC and all of the utilities in Texas are thinking, oh my God, we got to do this, but we got time. And again, we're early in the curve. We're just beginning to see the adoption of electric vehicles happen. And that's why we need to pass legislation this session to enable that to occur. Smitty, this is um, the first part of my question also had to do with um, grid upgrades. Austin Energy has repeatedly uh, complained that they can't allow maximization of distributed solar because the grid can't handle it. As an example, uh, they would not permit my house, personal testimony, they would not permit my house for the 5,000 kilowatt um, landscape that I had available, but only 4,000. And when I asked about that, the, the representatives from Austin Energy said the grid can't handle everybody in Austin who had a roof putting solar into the grid. They said the grid can't handle it. So I kept repeatedly asking them, 
what do you need to change in the grid to allow maximization of distributed solar? And they did, they didn't have an answer. So my question for you is what can the public utilities commission or other legislative bodies do to assist priming these uh, municipal utilities to begin upgrading their systems so that we can maximize the utility of solar where, where possible? It's a great question. And the first stop obviously is city council. And um, there are rate cases every five years, I think is my memory of how we, uh, what the statute currently requires. And uh, about every two, uh, about half that time, about every two and a half years, there is a um, kind of an update process. Part of the problem is it takes a while to build up the grid and Austin Energy um, hasn't really uh, developed a plan for as much solar as is going on the grid. I, as I ended my career at Public Citizen, we officed in a building basically across the street from the Capitol and a block away from the capital. And um, it was being built by foundation communities and they wanted to put solar on their rooftop as well and to be able to feed it back in. And the particular node in downtown Austin simply couldn't handle it because of an adequate transmission distribution system. Um, and Austin Energy and needs to be encouraged by the city council or ordered or mandated or whatever the right word is to um, get after that and start to begin to develop that plan. They are beginning to develop a plan, as, by the way, as well for the uh, amount of energy that's going to be consumed by electric vehicles. And this is a perfect confluence. I um, I have solar on all over my roof. I have everywhere I could possibly put solar. I've got it. I'm blessed with shade or cursed by shade. It's solar to a guy. If you want to look at it the other way, I'd rather have the shade. But, you know, my cost of energy, I am net zero um, all except three months of the year. And I would be net zero those other three months of the year if I didn't have an electric car. But the good news is I do and I'm paying for charging my car or I'm getting the energy from my car off of the solar systems. But there's a block there. I can't directly charge my car without going through the Austin energy system. And there is an opportunity here by changing policy to help figure out ways to enable you to charge your car or other battery storage and avoid overloading the grid here in Austin. It's stuff that's complex, but the city council needs to give clear direction to figure this out. It's just something we gotta do. Similarly, one of the things that's gonna happen, I think as a result of this session and the discussions we're gonna have is that the legislature is gonna give the PUC clear direction to do some forward planning to make sure we don't overload the grid with all the trucks that we expect to be going down the highways. At least that's my hope. Christopher, did you do want to ask your question about the used car market? Uh, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, um, so I didn't buy a brand new electric car. I bought used. And luckily for me, I knew uh, just enough about uh, the car um, you know, to, to know its relative health uh, of its battery pack. I, I wonder, however, that as, as electric vehicles really take off and uh, we, we see a very healthy used market developing, that um, those prospective buyers um, you know, might go into it with, with insufficient information uh, to really make a wise decision given their particular needs uh, for how they charge, how they drive, and you know, 
uh, and I, I can't help but think that, that the market isn't going to take care of this by itself, that, that consumer protection might be a very valuable thing. Is, is that something that uh, is worth uh, considering in your opinion? Oh, absolutely. And I share your concern. Um, I had to replace the battery in my Volt and I, I, I chose to go with a remanufactured battery that was uh, about half the cost of a brand new battery from Chevrolet. And that was somewhere north of 150,000 miles. So I, I complained, but not really that much. But I, at that point, started thinking about selling my car and started thinking about the poor people who might end up buying my car. And so when I listed it on Craigslist, I was very clear to say this car has got battery trouble. And it was real interesting that there were a number of people who called me up and said, I'm willing to buy it. I know how to replace the battery. And then some woman called me up who had little English, but was interested simply because of the price and obviously didn't understand the caveat. And I, I share your concern. I recently purchased a um, 10 year old hybrid SUV to replace my aged truck to reduce the pollution. Um, and when I did, I called uh, a San Antonio company because I bought it near San Antonio that um, came out to do a buyer's check. And I was very pleased that they had the technologies in their truck um, to be able to do a battery assessment on the hybrid battery. And they gave me a green light on, on the quality of the battery. And I'm now seeing a market evolving for those people who can test um, the health of purely EV batteries. The folks up at uh, Happy Hybrids, I think it is, um, offer that service and can test an electric vehicle battery and tell you whether or not you ought to buy the car. Are there structures we can put into place in Texas? Ideally, we can. Practically, in my former role at Public Citizen, I tried for over 40 years or over 30 years to come up with strategies around regulating the used car market, and I was an abject failure at that. Um, so it's a buyer beware market, uh, but we've got to come up with some strategies to educate people on what to look for and make sure the technology is uh, available in a certified way to mechanics who are advertising that they know how to repair and test these batteries. Great answer. Thank you, Smitty. There was a question about reducing two-stroke diesel, heavy equipment, those other sources of pollution. Um, has there been an effort at the state level to, to, to regulate that? And is there a timeline if there has been? Yes, there are a couple answers to that, Aaron. That's a great question. Um, without a doubt, the diesel engines are the largest emitters of noxious pollution. Um, we typically regulate in Texas nitrogen oxides because that's what the feds require us to do. But it's the fine particles that kill you and uh, the vol volatile organic compounds, which are carcinogens, that um, may or may not kill you, but will certainly make your life miserable. Uh, NOx is not particularly a good pollutant either, but um, the Fortunately, we're not in uh, violation of federal air quality standards for those two pollutants, and we're not yet in violation for the nitrogen oxides. Or, um, uh, but the, uh, but the, the question is, how are we going to regulate them? We don't regulate very much in Texas, but we do have this Texas Emission Reduction Program that I was involved in creating, we spent more than two billion dollars in Texas um, buying and replacing the oldest, dirtiest diesel engines in the fleet with newer, cleaner engines, most often a cleaner diesel vehicle, but 
largely for buses, a natural gas vehicle that significantly reduces emissions as well. And we're now offering electric vehicles as part of that fleet. And as they become commercially available, more often that's going to happen. We now have seen Austin Energy, or Capital Metro rather, uh, Dallas or DART Rapid Transit, and one of the other suburban cities like Louisville um, adopt electric vehicle buses as a target and as a goal. School districts are beginning to do so as well. And so we're starting to get that medium heavy duty fleet, uh, get those options out there and hopefully that transition will occur pretty rapidly because the costs make it, uh, lifetime costs are less now than um, the other. But you really reach an interesting point that for most of the world, they don't transport themselves using uh, internal combustion vehicles. And it's either buses or it's tut-tuts or, mo or um, mopeds or motorcycles. And electric vehicles and those applications are both available but are selling like hotcakes and are very close to close to cost parity in Asia in particular. And that's where the big emission reductions really come. And then for other um, two cycle motors, I have uh, an entire fleet of uh, battery operated lawnmowers, weed whackers, chainsaws, and my, um, my uh, two cycle engine mechanic, uh, two or three years ago when I came in once again for my annual clean out the carburetor on my two cycle motor mower that I have for um, battery emergencies. When are you gonna get rid of this thing and buy a battery operated mower? <laughs> it's, it's putting me out of business, but I tell you what, it's better for you as a consumer. So that transition is gonna happen very rapidly in that two cycle small engine market. Yeah, the one place I see it as being maybe a challenge is in the professional landscaping industry. Is I, I really haven't seen much headway in the electric side there. Nor have I. But I think I, after having purchased my, uh, I think it's now my 10th uh, electric hand tool or whatever, I have an entire bag full of green Ryobi or however you say that batteries that I carry with me. and I can cut a whole lot of trees with those batteries and I can mow a whole lot of, lawn of uh, I can do a whole lot of weed whacking. And I have 10 big batteries for my lawnmowers yet. But anyway, it's coming. Um, Chris was wondering if, if there's been any effort on the aviation industry side, particularly small aircraft and how polluting they are. Yep. Any, any efforts to clean up their fuels? Yes. And, um, Kevin Douglas, who's in a pilot for, I believe it is, Delta, is on our board. He works and lives in the Houston area. And he and several other pilots have gotten into the electric airplane business. And here's the sort of transitional moment. The perfect range uh, for an electric airplane is in the trainer. And so that's what they're manufacturing is planes that can be used for training pilots on how to fly. And the, the thing that's genius about this that I really love is most pilots fly by the seat of their pants, whether it's a, um, a small plane or a jetliner. There's all kinds of vibrations and, or, and cues through your ears that tell you how the plane's doing and all that sort of stuff. And if you train people on how to fly electric, they're going to be able to feel the impact of the air buffeting the plane, but they're not going to have all of those kinds of other signals on how the engines are doing, and they'll be much more likely to fly an electric airplane and willing to do that. And we're now seeing smaller models of things that are used for intra-city um, transportation like little helicopters and things like that that are coming out electric so it's the perfect Donald Trump mobile where you fly from your downtown Trump Tower out to LaGuardia so you can get on your jetliner 
but you know those little helicopters that are used in that kind of commuter special or livery special stuff are the perfect next technology to begin to electrify so it's beginning to happen are we there yet no are we coming up with strategies to get us there you bet Aaron, you're muted. Thank you, sorry. Uh, we're coming down to about four minutes left in the session. So um, I was wondering if you had any last thoughts you wanted to share or, and particularly um, provide some details on how to get in touch with you. Sure. Um, you can reach me at citizen.smitty at gmail.com. And you can go to our website or our Facebook page and all the information about how to contact me and the other staff at TechCetera is on that web page. But I do want to encourage you to uh, make the transition happen. And the fastest way you can do that is by calling your legislator and probably should wait until after elections right now. But um, and saying, hey, I want to visit with you about electric vehicles and some policy things that we hope will happen during the next session. In particular, if those of you who live out west of Austin and Don, Don Buckingham is your senator, that would be particularly helpful, depending on who wins the, some of the contested legislative seats around here, particularly all the House members are still in contest, whether Republicans or Democrats win. I've been doing this for 40 years, lobbying for 40 years. And one thing I've learned is politics is a contact sport those people who hit them often and sometimes hit them hard win the game of politics but unless you're making contact you're not having any impact and so that's the basic rule when we won the legislative battle to do renewable energy it was because we got citizens across the state reaching out and contacting their legislators cities large and small urban areas and, and uh, industrial areas said we want to do renewables because it's going to save us money and it's going to make an enormous change in air pollution. Depending on who you're talking to, it was Don Buckingham, don't ever talk about climate, everybody else in Austin, making sure they understand this is the next big solution to climate change will be an enormous help. But it's up to you to be able to win this battle to transform the transportation system in Texas. And we're counting on you. Thanks very much for taking the time to visit with me tonight. Thank you. I really appreciate your time. Yes, thank um, you very much. Appreciate you making the time to be with me tonight. And I, I thanks for your good questions. Yeah. I wanted to close um, by making a quick reference to the National Drive Electric Week. And I wanted to make sure that everybody knows that it's still going on until October 4th. So you can um, go to their website and see some other online um, sessions that are available still. Um, and then uh, if you go to austinev.org, you'll find more about our group, um, but then also um, have an opportunity to support the National Electric Auto Association, um, which we are a chapter of, um, and select Austin EV as your chapter.